So I want to uh, introduce Father Thomas here. Uh, just a little by way of introduction. So Father, uh, Father, Father Thomas, and uh, now his last name may be intimidating. <laughs> we we just kind of refer to him as Father Thomas and. And, and if you want to go further, you say Father Thomas K. But not too many have tried that. Kucha Lumen Chuwatil. Kucha Lumen Chuwatil. Kucha Lumen Chuwatil. Ready? Kucha Lumen Chuwatil. So it's Mr. Father Kucha Lumen Chuwatil. Okay? All right. We won't have a test on that. Can you so, spell it? Excuse me, Father, for, uh, I mean, I, I have Sosnowski and people have trouble with that. <laughs> okay, so anyway, Father Thomas has been traveling to Ocean City from Tanzania to assist us here at St. Damien and ministering to this great influx of visitors that we have in the summer. He's been coming here for eight years. Eight years. Eight years. Yay. Uh, Praise God. Praise God, right? Father Thomas is a member of the Congregation of Missionaries of St. Francis de Sales. And when he's not here in the summer, he actually has another job. He's the director of the Lumen Christi Institute in Arusha, Arusha, Arusha Tanzania. Uh, he holds a PhD in philosophy. Uh, he's a published author and, of course, a great teacher. Um, I, I just by way of trivia, this is like maybe little little known facts about Father Thomas. Uh, so I asked him about his name, right? And he said, this, this, is, this is the story, right? He said that uh, that name uh, really originates from his ancestors, and he's not quite sure how far back that goes. But an area of land was given to his ancestors in the south of India, and the name of the land is, is uh, Kuchalum uh, Go ahead. Kuchalum Chuwatil. Kuchalum Chuwatil, okay. And uh, so that became their family name. So it's like, you know, you have a family name and then I'm Sosnowski Joseph. That's, that's his family name. Uh, and it literally means under the small Bodhi tree. Bodhi tree. <coughs> and Bodhi tree in India is the tree of enlightenment. So I think somehow that's appropriate, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, so I think we would hopefully we'll get I think some enlightenment today. Now when I when I introduced this uh, in, uh, last week, uh, someone asked me now. So is this going to be followed by confessions? Oh, well, that's a great idea. We do have a priest, so if the spirit moves you, Father will be here. All right. Okay. All right. And with that, Father, I turn it over to you. So thank you. Check out the volume and then do what is best. Okay. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. Good morning, Father. You can hear me? Yes. We shall begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God loving Father, we thank you for the gift of all of us. We thank you for the gift of our parish St. Damien. We thank you for the gift of our faith. We ask you today to send your Holy Spirit upon us, to enlighten us, so that we can remember, understand the capital sins and the way in which Satan tempts us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. First of all, it is my honor to be with you. Uh, when Joe asked me, could you do something for this uh, ongoing faith formation of adults, I said, I will be very happy. I said, I will learn more from you than you learn from me. Because many people ask me, what's the reason why I come to Ocean City every year? One of the reasons I tell our fathers and our seminarians, as well as to every person, is I learn a lot from you, my dear parishioners who come 
every day for daily mass because your faith is what leavens our ministry as a priest. Because when I come to the 8.30 mass, sometimes I see around 200 people. You could now just lie down on your bed, you know, relaxed on a, on a ordinary day. So therefore, I always enjoy celebrating the Eucharist, seeing your faith, seeing your devotion. So I said, I will learn more from you. And from the various presentations that I have been attending here, I also came to know how knowledgeable you are, how well read you are in the matters of spiritual life. So I thought, this is an encounter where I will learn also from you. So therefore, it's an honor for me to be with you, to learn from you, okay? So I think we can take it from that perspective. Uh, basically, what I would like to do in this presentation is, I am sure all of us are, all of us have studied about the capital sin uh, during our religious education and we remember them obviously. But what I want to do today is just to go through quickly what does it mean, how do we really practice those capital sins or the inclinations, how do they come and in what way we can overcome. In just a nutshell, okay? And then I hope it will be done between 35 to 40 minutes then we will have what we call discussion, sharing. However, if you have any questions or something is not clear, you can stop me. Is that clear? Is this okay? Very good. So let's begin. Let me begin this way. I am sure all of us who are here are concerned with our health, our physical health. Some of us go monthly, some of them, some of us go maybe six months or in a year to a doctor. Am I right? And the doctor will ask you, how is your physical health? And in order to get a background about, they will ask you, what do you eat? Do you exercise? How is your sleep? And then you say, yeah, for breakfast probably I have two or three pancakes, two or three eggs, uh, you know, I don't do much exercise. Immediately the doctor will jump and say, you are in a mortal danger because your physical health is almost going and therefore you need to be careful, you need to discipline, you need to watch out with regard to your physical health. Immediately what we do, ah, oh, please tell me doctor what I have to do, right? Yes, it is the same with regard to our spiritual life. Our spiritual life also needs a constant examination of how this is being affected. And that is why the church in its wisdom has given us the seven capital sins. It, they are the ones through which we can check every time from time to time the spiritual growth of our life, the spiritual maturity of our life, and that is why the fathers of the church has called them capital sins or some of them are called deadly sins. Now, of course, why it is called capital, you must have this question. They are called capital because it comes from the Latin word capu, that means it is head. So in other words, they are the sources from which all other actual sins originate. They are the inclinations from which all other actual sins originate. That is why it is called capital sins. Whether it is grave sins, whether the particular sins, whether it is mortal sins, whether it is venial sins, all of them and their repetition happens 
because it is the source, they are the heads from which the actual sins that we experience. That leads to the spiritual corruption of the person. That is why the fathers of the church have paid more attention and ask every one of us to pay attention to it. Now, of course, we know the seven deadly sins as they are called in the Catechism of the Catholic Church as well as in our own uh, literature of review that you will be seeing. The first one is called, obviously, pride. That's the most important one. After a little time, we will are going to look at it. And the second one is called envy. We could call envy as the daughter of pride, actually, or son of pride, whatever. Maybe we shall not make a gender issue through that. To that. Okay. Uh, so uh, the third one is called anger. Anger is obviously we are going to look at it. And the uh, fourth one is called the sloth. And the fifth one is called the greed or avarice. And the fifth, uh, yeah, the fifth one is called, sixth one is called the gluttony, and the sixth, uh, seventh one is called the lust. So I'm sure uh, the order in which is very important as well. Uh, I will speak about that one a little later towards the end of it, why this order is very important and what is the reason why we need to pay attention to them. So pride, envy, anger, sloth, greed, gluttony, and lust. They are the seven capital sins or called deadly sins. Now, I thought of putting it in a very, very pragmatic and simple way. If you pay attention to the word that I have written pride there, what do you see at the middle? I is a large, am I right, yes or no? And that's precisely pride. That is precisely <laughs> pride, okay? So that's why I have kept, you know, so that you will get, you know, theoretically at the image way, you will get an idea what exactly is pride. Now look at actually the way in which the church understands pride or the way in which uh, if you go into the whole doctrine, how do they call it pride? Pride is inordinate desire for one's own excellence or arrogating to oneself is the unique prerogative that is given to God or we want to be like gods. So this is actually in the heart of pride. So pride is said to be complete when we refuse to subject our oneself to God. In other words, I want me to be God. And precisely what happened with a person with the pride. So, a person with the pride, and this is how we experience in our daily life, in the way of the relationships, in the way that we live. So, a person with the pride refuses to subject his intellect, his will to God. His intellect and will becomes uniquely his own and refuses to subject to God. As we know, we are creatures and therefore, as creatures, we have to surrender and submit ourselves to God. When we refuse to submit ourselves, our intellect and will to God, we say we have pride. And to be obey His commandments. The commandments are given to us and we know when we refuse to obey the commandments of God, this is what happens. And so, a person with the pride has a contempt to God, God and who presents or who represents Him. That is why the authority, we represent the authority, whether it is a political authority, whether it is religious authority, whether it is moral authority, because we believe that they come from God. And that is why pride is 
this refusal or a manifestation of our contempt towards them is called the pride. Just to take into the examples from uh, scripture, from the book of Genesis, we know what was the sin of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve wondered how the knowledge of good and evil, which is actually uniquely the prerogative of God. <clears throat> so Adam and Eve wanted to be like God. They wanted, they wanted to actually capture that one. Actually, that's the problem. And this is what is taking place every time in the life of the person filled with pride. So in fact, in the history of the church and the history of humanity, this is the battle that is going on. What is the battle between Lucifer and St. Michael? And in fact, St. Michael is coming from Mikael, actually, uh, in, a, in a Hebrew would mean who is like God? In other words, Michael is, and Michael is representing and accepting God and therefore submitting and surrendering himself to God. Whereas Lucifer wants to grab the divinity. So pride is like Lucifer trying to grab the divinity for oneself and make oneself as a god, whereas St. Michael is the one who likes to surrender and submit and make others belong to God. So this is the battle that the humanity experienced at the heart of our life. And this is very important, these images that uh, with regard to pride that we can speak about. So, <clears throat> in fact, the pride is connected to vain glory. In our everyday experiences of ordinary Christian living, this pride is connected with vain glory. That is, the inordinate desire to manifest his own excellence and to receive praise. So we could call what we call the ego trip, or I did this. I can give you a short example or uh, life experiences of my own religious congregation. Uh, we have a priest, and if you visit him, he will give you a tour, and he will tell you, you know, I, I built this building. I did this one. I did this one. So the three letters that will be there in his speech is I, me, and my. I, me, and my. So at one encounter with him, when I was visiting him, I counted almost 100 times in one hour. <laughs> so, so much so, I told him, uh, I don't want to tell his name. I mean, even if I tell, there's no problem. His name is Father Sunny. So I told him, Father Sunny, which would mean that only you are here, nobody else is involved in this one. What about those people who built it? Probably you have masterminded, you have helped. There are the builders, there were people who contributed, there were so many people involved. But what happened? Cramping everything into the box <coughs> of I, me, and mine. So in other words, the praise that is due to God, you want to get it for yourself. And for this you do everything. So the projection of I in all what one does in order to get the praise, in order to get the glory, that is the real problem. That is what it is called the vain glory. So this is very important. This is what actually we need to be on the check. And this is precisely because psychologically we need it. We need praise, we need appreciation, we need uh, uh, people to acknowledge what you do. But what happens, it becomes a habit in our life. We can say we have a pattern. We are tempted by the devil precisely in that inclination. And this is what we can call 
pride or inordinate desire. I think in the context of America, I think it is, I can't remember exactly, I was reading uh, some time, uh, it is concerned with, I think, the abortion and the right to life, etc., in one of the biggest court cases, I think. Uh, the judge gave a verdict, and the, 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 the very content of that verdict is, Liberty at the heart of liberty or individual freedom is considered by him as to determine for oneself, one's own existence, meaning of life and the meaning of the universe. To determine for oneself, one's existence, meaning of life and meaning of the universe. That is, what is of God you want to take to ourselves. This is the culture in which we are living. And this is what sometimes people of that nature is looking for. My dear friends, this is what I call, we need to make, if you want to really move out from this, what I call, quoting actually one of the famous theology in Baltimore who says, we need to move from the ego drama to what we can call theo drama. In the ego drama, what happens? I write the script, I am the actor, I am the producer, I am everything. In the ego drama, and we like it because everybody will be giving, oh, you did it, you did it. And so we are very happy about that one. But in the theo drama, I break open my ego, allow God to write the script, allow God to direct my life, allow God to direct the steps that I take. It is in this pure drama that we uniquely become a creature, a person who is willing to walk with God along with the other actors because everybody has a specific role. That is why, according to the priority of this sin, pride is the deadliest of the deadly sin, is the most important. So this is very important. So any person who refuses to enter into the theodrama, drama, but curves into oneself, as St. Augustine would say, that means going within oneself and everything is looked from oneself becomes a problem. That's why this has to be in the meditation, in the examination of conscience that we have to make every day. If you want to really come out, am I making an ego drama every day in my life or am I making a theology? So according to St. Thomas, St. Thomas Aquinas is one of my favorite and has many answers to most of our problems. You know, once I was giving <clears throat> a lecture on philosophy of religion in Cambridge, and of course, wherever I go, I go with my Roman collar shirt because, uh, and they asked me, you are a priest, and that's why I said, okay, I, I'm not really speaking from the perspective of my religious convictions, but it is also based on the natural law because the natural law, as St. Thomas was very much, you know, trying to speak. So in the Cambridge, I was arguing with one of the greatest, you know, the, uh, uh, what we call the liberal philosophers, you know, about the, some of the issues on the religion. So uh, I like to call because St. Thomas is very good. And St. Thomas, if you look at in the Summa Theologica, you would say, it is a very dangerous vice because a person is so susceptible to it due to the woundedness of original sin. So it will grow quickly without recognition and take hold, infecting all that we do. That is why we need to continually check this pride, how they come into our life, how we infect our life. In all what we do, in our relationship, this can become a serious problem. That's why an examination of conscience is very important. And the other person, of course, that I love, 
uh, in my life, and the, you know, the best model for priests is uh, uh, St. John Vianney, a simple person, you know, a simple priest, you know, uh, who, who said, pride makes us hate our equals because they are our equals. So because only I, you remember? The I. So therefore I don't want uh, into the equal. In, uh, it makes us to hate our inferiors from the fear that they may equal us. So the pride. And we hate our superiors because they are above us. So what happens at the end of the day, it is only the I. That is actually the heart of the problem. So, what is the spiritual remedy uh, suggested by uh, uh, the, the church as well as the fathers of the church according to the tradition? The obvious answer is regular and thorough self-examination of conscience. That is why in the, in the Christian tradition, before we go to bed, we are supposed to make the examination of uh, conscience, where we are able to really see how I experienced the day. Did I make myself as the center of life, or did God has become the center? Theodrama or egotrama? The practice of humility, meditation and uh, imitation on Christ's humility and service is the best way in which we can slowly, slowly overcome the pride. And this is very, very important. So, as I said, the next one is called envy. So how to, we can say, how to, we can define envy is Sadness on account of the goods possessed by another which are regarded as harmful to oneself since they diminish one's own excellence or <coughs> renown. As I said, when it is I, something good happens to the other, I am very sad. <laughs> For example, you know, I like, I love them. The moment the other person has got a better house, oh. <laughs> the other person has a better trouser than me, hmm. <laughs> you see, envy is actually because you remember from the pride eye, it generates the enemy because envy, because you see what the good the other person possessed is not appreciated and loved, the other person gets more praise, more recognition of what that person is having, and therefore I become envious. And this is what. So what happens then? Envy breeds hatred. Then what happens? I did not speak about it, am I right? So the talk of the town will be, hmm, you know how she got it, those things? <laughs> Gossip, am I right? So what happens, mentally you begin to work out so many stories in order to make your ego boost and the other person to go down. And you want to talk to somebody, yes or no? Because, you know, gossip cannot remain inside, pride cannot, because of, out of the pride envy, you have to talk to somebody. And it's very important, because you have the inclination to talk to somebody. So what happens the next time you are on the phone with, even if that person is not interested, you begin to talk. You know what happened to that person? <laughs> Uh, in the religious circle, I mean, the religious communities where I come, I always tell to the fathers, you know, don't waste your time, don't waste your energy, and don't waste your money by talking about other person, because most of the time, we will be gossiping without uh, knowing. You understand? Because this is very, very, uh, very, uh, something that is very natural, you know. Uh, so what happens? We get distracted. We are not able to focus on ourselves and the things that we want to focus on because our attention is on what is the other. 
There are certain people always they will be opening their uh, uh, curtain and seeing what is happening in the the other people's lives. Am I right? Yes or no? Eh? They are not satisfied with the, this one. And of course, resentment. Yeah, he got it, she got it. You know. So therefore, this is what happens. So if all these are taking place, definitely envy is part of our uh, life, and that's why again it's very important that we make uh, a real examination of conscious regardless. So envy not only does an envious person resent another person's good, be they talents, looks, possessions, work or popularity, he also takes joy in and even religious in the setback or adversity that a person faces. The other side of the enemy is if something bad happens, what happens? Oh, good, 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 you know? And especially in the relationship, it can also happen in yeah, rivalry with the siblings, it can happen between the neighbors, it can happen between best friends. So envy, you know, is, is actually very pervasive in the life of many Christians and therefore is very important. And that's why envy is a vicious sin because it creeps into the best of relationships that we need to become very, very uh, uh, careful and we need to take a real um, um, examination of conscience if you want to really overcome. So, uh, what is the best way to overcome? I think the best way I always uh, tell uh, people who have this problem, stop comparison. Stop comparison. Remember, my dear brothers and sisters, you are uniquely created by God. You are not photocopies, and you, God doesn't want any photocopies. Then it will be boring. Am I right? Yes or no? We are, each of us are unique, and each, all of us have unique gifts and talents. And therefore, what happened? When we stop comparison, when you see yourself as a gift from God, when you see the other as a gift from God, in the particular circumstances of our life, we become the most joyful person and happiness begin to begin to emulate from you. That's why the famous book you must have heard, happiness is an inside job. You can have hundreds of things. In comparison, you want this, you want this, but it will not make you happy. It will not give you the joy from inside. But what will make ultimately happy is what is inside. And for this, you have to stop comparison. Because the other person is uniquely God blesses, not the way God blesses you. Is that clear? And that is why comparison. Stop comparison. The moment you stop comparison, you will begin to enjoy your life because you see the blessings that God gives. And of course, what is the antidote for envy? It's admiration. Ah, I see. That is good. That person is coming. Let us say, good house. Thank God. I am very happy. I really joy in it. I really thank God for that blessing. I appreciate and admire in the life of that person happening. Allah Sandandil, we do this admiration daily in our life. Our relationships can uh, lead to envy. So that's very really important. So let me go a little more faster and then we can have questions, of course. Uh, so the third one is, of course, anger. <coughs> I will not speak about that one. I think all of us have somehow uh, experienced the anger uh, in our life. <clears throat> so, anger is the inordinate desire for revenge. It is an inordinate or an excessive desire for uh, revenge. So, of course, there is a distinction between the anger that is righteous, for example, many people come and ask me, what about the Jesus cleansing the temple? He was filled with anger. Of course, righteous anger is good. In certain times, in order to reinforce what is good, you can, and that is definitely, there is no wrong. 
what we are talking about is the wrongful anger that is against charity that is expressed in the unkind words that we speak, hurtful statements that we make, in fact, that is intended precisely to hurt and to cut the other person. There are people who say, yeah, I made that statement publicly because I want the heart to feel that way. I want him to uh, feel that way. Because what happened, it is meditated, it is brooding over that what I want to make precisely this one, and that is what uh, revenge would. There are people like that, you know. I know in one example where I walked into a family reunion, they called me there, <clears throat> and all the children came, um, two of the brothers were not talking for some time, you know, almost uh, one year or so. You see, when they almost came face to face, the other fellow almost hit the, uh, you know, he wanted to give a kick to this person, but he cannot do it. So what did he do? He gave a kick to the, uh, the nearby uh, desk or bench that was there, a kick. I noticed it. <laughs> I noticed it. And so later I asked him, I said, yes, I meant to give him a kick because I don't like him. I don't still like him. You see? The actions, you see. So he was brooding over. He wanted to give him a hick, really. But what happened in that uh, atmosphere was not so good. So it directs or diverts itself into something else, you see. See, anger is very dangerous. And you know, so many of us can sometimes experience in our life the way. And in fact, this has got a very physical as well as a psychological effects on us, you know. Eh? The person with anger can have ulcers, you know, acidity problems in our life. And there are so many physical uh, negative impact that it can cause both on our body and our psychological relationship. In fact, anger is very, very, uh, serious and therefore we need to. And if you have this type of taking vengeance, revenge, it is very, very important that we become aware of that one. I like um, Sir Catherine of Siena who said, there is no sin nor a wrong that gives a person such a foretaste of hell in this life as anger and death, impatience. Eh? So I said, if you want to experience hell or heaven, depends upon the choice that you make in terms of relationship, especially in this uh, area. So uh, we could say these are some of the effects of the everyday life. How do we experience anger if you want to really go through them? So the effects of anger, as I see, can be seen in this way. Mental disturbance, you know, we are mentally disturbed because we are angry about somebody or something has happened. And we are not able to enter into a real communion and relationship. And so therefore, every time, whether you sit in prayer, even you are traveling, or you are doing something again and again, it comes in your mind, you know? It's a mental disturbance that's very important. Blasphemy, so what happened? You don't know what you are talking about, yeah? about that person, uh, related to that person. So quarrels, you know, easily you can pick up quarrels with that person because if the relationship is directed, it can be to your spouse, it can be about your children, about your neighbor, about any person, you know, quarrels comes in. Abuse, abuse, verbal abuse mostly take place because the root cause is actually anger because we have not loving that person from the heart, loving that person. You see, and therefore what happens, anger becomes noisy, you know, how do we raise our voices, how our whole temperature goes down when we are in anger, am I right, okay? So, an indignation, you know, we become indignant to other things. So, these are some of the effects of anger. So, we can examine for ourselves and see how we experience this uh, in our personal life, of course. What is the spiritual remedy? What is the antidote to anger is forgiveness. 
and I always cut the word give before somebody asks you. That's called for. For in of course it means before give. For give. That means before even that person asks, I have the desire to go and give. You see, this person has hurt me with a word. I know it hurt me. Even before she thinks that she has hurt, I go and say, I'm sorry. I know you have hurt me, but I have forgiven you. You see, what happened? Forgive. What happens when you begin to think in your mind, she did it to harm me, then you start brooding over this one, it uh, creates within you all the effects that what I was uh, trying to talk about. That's why this is what precisely Jesus did from the cross. What did Jesus say? Jesus did not speak to any of them. Jesus just forgave, which means Gave you before they asked the soldiers and those who killed him. Father, they do not know what they do. What a beautiful giving before asking. That is called forgiveness. Unless and until we practice daily in our relationship, in our inner relationships, this becomes very difficult. That's why this is very, very important in the, the spiritual remedy with regard to. Now, probably I would say sloth is the long forgotten <laughs> uh, uh, sin, I think, and many people, oh sorry, uh, they don't uh, even, with regard to the confessions, they don't even talk about sloth. But I tell you, the most important and the dangerous sin today in the society faces is sloth, especially in the life of a Christian. I will tell you why. Because sloth is sorrow in the face of spiritual good in as much as it is God's good. So what is it? Sloth is the spiritual laziness. That means a lukewarmness towards divine things. A lukewarmness with regard to divine things. So that is why a person who has got a sloth is interested in, not interested in spiritual things. Prayer. Prayer is for those who are, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, some people say, ah, that's for elderly, those who go to daily church, etc. Ah, eh, prayer before meals. Yeah, it's not the uh, you know, what is a prayer before meal? You are thanking God, the source of all gift. You are not actually the gifted man. Suppose something happens to you and all your finances are dried out. What will happen to you? Remember what is before you is a, a gift from God. If you don't have life, how will you enjoy? <laughs> Even your life itself is a gift. When you wake up every day morning, it's a gift from God. <coughs> and that is very important. So prayer is that the spiritual connection that you experience. And in this with regard to that spiritual connection, you feel you are really happy to do it. You know, that is what. This prayer for salvation. Somebody speaks to you about the spiritual things and you are so, uh, you know, going back to, ah, that sort of thing is a religious thing. I'm not interested, you know, thinking, ah, you know, nowadays when we speak to especially young people, ah, it's okay, ah, that type of uh, oh, expression. Am I right? How hard about that word? Okay. This is very much, in, I would say, sloth is the way in which enemy today walks in the life of many, many people, especially in the life of a uh, uh, Christian. So, well, physical sloth and spiritual sloth are actually connected. Laziness, that's why we say idleness is the, the ideal place is the devil's workshop, we say. Is that, am I right? When our mind, when our body, when our spirit is idle, the evil one is uh, very, very steadily working, and this is very important. So laziness in the physical sloth is uh, procrastination, idleness, indifference, non-challenge, etc. Whereas in the spiritual sloth, this state was spiritual, hurried, crowding of emotions, lukewarmness, 
failure to cultivate new virtues, you know. Yes, I am in the path of cultivating virtues. When a new virtue comes, I say, ah, I'm not interested, you know. A spiritual person has to steadily grow, and in that steadily growth, this is what actually slowly becomes an important thing. Of course, <clears throat> what is the, uh, the most important thing with regard to the spiritual remedy that is needed to overcome sloth is a zeal for the mission. A zeal for the mission. This is what actually today Christians like. And the best example is Mary at the visitation. When Mary receives Jesus into her heart, into her life, into her womb, she is ready to visit her cousin Elizabeth, to share that joy and to be at the service of Elizabeth. This is very important. People filled with this uh, uh, spiritual good has to share. And this is very important. When we like, when there is a slightness in that mission, Imagine all of you are here, filled with zeal for the mission. How many people will be able to be brought by to the church? Begin to think. Begin to think. This is important. That's why maybe in the next, uh, in the, this generation, the most important, I would say, with regard to our problem is sloth, and especially this like of what I call the zeal for the mission. This is very important. Mission does not see my dear brothers and sisters going abroad or uh, evangelizing, going to, to be a missionary, etc. The mission for a Christian is actually this, namely bring the spiritual things and communicating to those who are with you, around you and speak profoundly about it and leave it in your life. You become the motivating factor, you become the example, you become the driving force. And this is very important and that's what precisely made. Mary did not travel, Mary traveled only to the hills country, that's probably with me. I traveled the same way Mary did actually when I was in Jerusalem. So it is a, it, it, it is a beautiful experience, so it is a beautiful experience. So let me go fast. Uh, uh, so almost that. Uh, uh, greed, uh, greed we know. So greed or avarice is the inordinate love for having possessions or uh, riches, we know. Eh? Or it's called uh, also avarice. Eh? Uh, so a person motivated by greed is preoccupied with the having and having more. So attaches such a value to wealth and possessions and accumulation and retention of them become the major goal of life. This is what happens with regard to person filled with the greed or others. Preoccupied with the having and having and having and attaches every value and everything else is seen in terms of what I have. How much money I have in the bank account, how much millions I hold, you know everything is in terms of money, possessions, accumulation and riches and, and that becomes a major goal in the life of that person who becomes a, a, a person with a uh, <clears throat> filled with uh, uh, what we call this uh, uh, greed. So, different uh, forms of greed that we can experience, material things, always wanting more, time. Hmm? So many people think it is only with regard to having. No, we can be greedy with regard to our time. <laughs> that is only doing what will benefit them in some way. So they choose time only for the benefit of themselves and not taking the other person and spend only time for uh, themselves. They will never be able to spend time. They will be looking at time when you enter into even a conversation, you know. Sorry, I had to go. Am I right? Of course, I know I had the time, you know. So, but the important time, you know, relationship. Today, many people in their relationship are greedy. We don't know. And that's why we need to examine what is it? Collecting people for status or using people for uh, advantage. That is greed. 
I am entering into a relationship with this particular person and target this person because I will have an advantage. I will be in relationship with this person because I will get some status. All these are hidden manifestations of greed in various forms. And that is why this is also very, very important uh, with regard to our life to manifest. So, a person with the greed is hard-hearted, blind to the needs of less fortunate, so self-sufficiency, complacency, and a kind of feeling independence from God. In fact, this is the problem at the heart of Western Europe and America is because we profess what we call this type of wealth. Our inclination is towards this world. That's why we need to become counterculture. As Christians, as Catholics, as people who profess, it is very important. It is not saying no to wealth. Wealth is seen as a gift from God and having an attachment, not having an attachment to this, it is very, very important. So, teachings of John Bailey Viani, he said, Avarice is an inordinate love of riches and the good things of this life. Jesus Christ, to cure us of it, was born in extreme poverty, deprived of all comfort. He chose a mother who was poor. He willed to pass as the son of a humble workman. What is important is a soul filled with the love for him and inscribed with the good deeds. Remember, when you die, it is not how much you have in the bank, how many things you possess, but rather this verse has to be remembered. What is important is a soul filled with, him, uh, with love for him and inscribed with the good deeds. That's very important. So, just uh, give you uh, exam, uh, what they call most important thing with regard to the spiritual way to overcome. The most important thing is generosity. Generosity with regard to resources that we possess, generosity with the time that we have, generosity with our relationship. And as I said, give things to love. That is what I think at the heart of Mother Teresa. Remember, being increases in the measure you give. Your being is very important. The more you give love, the more you get back. Not only in getting back, you grow in love. You give money, the money is gone away. Material things it does not increase in giving. Whereas in the spiritual things that you possess and the being increases in giving. And this is very important. Arms giving. That's why one of the ways in which to overcome this avarice or this one is alms giving. Or what we call, it was a long tradition of the church even from the Old Testament. I think it is almost forgotten by many people what we call tithing. That is 10% of the income one has to the church, to the charity or things etc. So that uh, it is a way of saying thank you for the Lord, for the less fortunate. You know, this is the practical way in which we can today really uh, experience what we call uh, 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 experience. So we have only two more to go, okay? So I'll finish faster. Um, <laughs> that is gluttony. I think I'm sure all of us know what is gluttony. Gluttony is an inordinate desire for food and drink. As you know, uh, sorry. So it is injurious, of course, to mental health. It is injurious to physical health. It is also injurious to actually to mask the spiritual problem, if any of us, you know. Eh? We want to hide certain things and therefore into eating, you know, too much for many people. And then what happened? It is manifest in the laziness with regard to spiritual slow takeover, and then it leads to lust and other things, okay? So therefore, this is a sin that is connected uh, with regard to our life. So, of course, what is the most important thing? Gluttony, the most important thing is virtue of temperance or practice of asceticism. 
I always say, and during, especially Lent as well as in our seminary, I always have Fridays, you know, optional to come for a dinner. It is important. Sometimes we have to go hungry, saying, you know, evening. I'm saying no to a particular meal in my life. It's good. It has got a physical health, well-being as well as, you know, instead of all the time concentrating on food. It can manifest in our daily life, choosing the food that we like. Sometimes some people in their entire conversation, food becomes and drink becomes their conversational issue. You know, everything is on food and drink. You know, there are so many ways it is going to be. <coughs> and this, what I call practice of temperance and asceticism is very, very important if you want to overcome gluttony. And this is very, very important for our life and it is very beneficial for uh, our life. Um, so the last one is, of course, uh, probably many people who are struggling today, uh, whatever age we are in, is what we call uh, lust. What is lust? Lust is the inordinate desire for sexual pleasure here a person selfishly seeks to satisfy one's own sexual desire. So, lustful person seeks one's own sexual desires, personal fleeting gratification. So, others what happen? Merely a body rather than a person. We are created as persons and it has to enter into a personal relationship of encounter. So, in the other, in the lust, what happened, the other person stands to be an object of my gratification. I just make use of that person to satisfy, and so she or he will never become a subject, but rather an object of my gratification. So this is a very, very, day. and in fact I would say this is very, very um, serious in the life of many people. So, since stemming from lust includes dwelling on impure thoughts, masturbation, fornication, adultery, and viewing pornography. My dear brothers and sisters, from my experience of guiding so many people, especially in the spiritual life, I have come across pornography has become an important problem. And just allow me to share a few things about that one and how to overcome. First of all, remember pornography is a very, I would say, multi-billionaire business. <laughs> it is a business rather than anything else. And I think it is a good tool in the hand of the enemy to to. to. And imagine there was a survey conducted, I think, in Europe and America, the accessibility of the pornography now to even, they would say, on an average, from nine years old onwards, uh, people are, you know, children with nine years are uh, hooked into that one. You know, they see it, the images, and then what happens, each time they get addicted to that one, you know, the brain is wired towards that one, you know, all that effects, you know, more than me about that one. So that is why we need to become aware of this and we have to fight against it because it is a consumerist tendency and they want to bring more and money into the industry and therefore a new new stuffs are coming into that one and that is why many people are inclined to look at it remember sexual expression sexuality is according to the catholic church is a beautiful thing and according to the status of life, they can be, as I will see, um, as I have put it, you know, uh, the, the remedy is practice of chastity. And I like to put it always, I tell, what is an upright expression of sexuality in one's own state of life? That is chastity. Upright expression of sexuality in one's state of life. That means, a correct conjugal relationship between a husband and a wife in a marital relationship is chastity because they enter into a communion of persons as a, the other as husband and wife and they have the legitimate expression. All other things is 
As I have told you what happens, it is a deprivation and making the other person as an object. And this is very important. And of course, the next week, when you will ask me questions, I will explain about some of the other issues with regard to all these problems, quoting, I think, from the natural law. I will explain to you from St. Thomas' perspective what exactly is the problem. But I think this is a serious problem that we need to confront. The best way, say no to your life to any type of pornography, and that is very important. And that power comes from the power to say no in your mind. And of course, with the grace of God, it is possible. I have worked with many people. It's a big problem in the life of many women and men, young or old. And therefore, this is very important that we need to become aware of that one. So I just want to uh, end my presentation with uh, what the fathers of the church or the spiritual masters from the desert tradition would say, capital sins or any sin could be called cry in the heart. I don't know whether you have heard about it, cry in the heart. Now, I like this, that's why I try to show the image. If you have paid attention, you know, though you are a very observant person, whether you have a terrace or you have a cemented floor or a concrete floor, after the rain, if you have noticed, wherever there is a cry, what happens? The water gathers slowly into that cry. Am I right? All other places will be dry, but the water will be gathering to that particular place there is a little cry. Am I right? And around that area it will be wet. And that water remains for a long time. Slowly, slowly, it enters into the cry. If you don't do anything, the cry becomes uh, bigger and bigger. This is what precisely the capital sins. They are the sources, they are the heads of sins. In our human life, they all have, because as a human person, all these are part of our life. Am I right? That's all no, because this is connected with our life. So what happened? An examination of conscience is an examination. Where is that uh, cry? Where is that water gathering? <clears throat> How I can once again remedy it and fill with the grace of God that is happens in the sacrament of reconciliation. Thank you very much for listening. Sorry for taking time. Thank you. So, questions, uh, compliments, you know, I am sure you will have more answers than me. So, or something that you want to share. Anything that is not clear, anything that is, uh, yes. I was thinking, like, as you're going through your presentation, frequently there was the use of the word inordinate. Mm -hmm. This is an inordinate desire for you know, gratification, whatever. Inordinate desire for money. I got all that, but, but from the capital sins, that these are, are natural, they can be natural desires, mm -hmm. so when they get into the sinful aspect, they become inordinate. Mm -hmm. But the one thing I did not get was, when you talked about anger, you said, you had a quote, inordinate desire for revenge. Mm -hmm. That didn't make sense to me, because I'm trying to think of an appropriate desire for revenge, and I couldn't think of one. And so I wonder where you got that quote from. <clears throat> Yeah, the anger, the, the, the inordinate desire is the way in which actually all the sins have been uh, in the Catholic Church, in the tradition of St. Thomas Aquinas. This is how they define the sins, okay? So with regard to the anger, as I have told you, anger is very, very difficult to, to measure in a way, you know. This is ordinate, this is inordinate. That's why we always give the example of a righteous anger. Righteous means here an anger that is really appropriate in the situation. Let us ask, that's why I quote from the scripture, especially uh, Jesus entering into the temple and driving out all those people. You remember in that particular. There, what happened? He assesses the situation where <coughs> temple is supposed to be a place where 
they have to experience the presence of God, they turned it into a place where they can do the merchandise and profit. So what happened? Filled with that anger, anger that is legitimately coming something that he has to express. So that is called a legitimate anger. Now, your question is, how do we see it in the, let us say, daily life experiences, etc. That has to be slowly, we have to make a discernment. That is why it's, uh, what uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola in questions with regard to anger would say, discernment is a virtue that we need to practice in order to cultivate anger. Because every situation is uh, changing. How do we express your legitimate anger to your wife who is going in a certain way? How do you express your anger, legitimate anger, the ordinate anger, to your uh, children who may be, let us say, 10 years old, maybe 20 years old, the expressions take a uh, different. That is where a Christian is called to practice the virtue of uh, what we call discernment. And that comes in there with experience. I see what you're talking about, that ordinate anger. That yeah. makes sense. But, yeah. but ordinate revenge, that's what doesn't make sense. Yeah, me. it is not ordinate revenge. It is actually, it becomes then an expression that is harmful. Mm -hmm. That is where it is meant, yeah. Yes. <clears throat> I think anger is, we've all seen it on the news or seen it in our neighborhoods or families that the person who's so angry that they, because they think someone cut them off, mm -hmm. so they shoot them. The person who thinks somebody cut them, cut, cut from them in a line. Like I think that anger is so many different forms. And is it because underneath someone's unhappy? Is it because underneath they're envious of your car, or your clothes, or whatever? But I feel like anger, as much as it's not the toxin, it's so pervasive in our society that it's, from a religious point, is it a lack of grace? But I think underneath it's like basic unhappiness leads to so many of these sins, but especially anger. And some people have more of a temper, so whether it's managing that temper to what's appropriate expression of that anger, or just saying enough's enough. Yeah. And that's, I, I think, also, whether it's as a wife, a mother, a teacher, your job, whatever, that it's hard to walk that line. So that's where I guess the discernment comes in. Yes, exactly. Like what's worth your time and what's... Yes, exactly, yeah. They are all interconnected in that sense. You know, it is not... They, they are not actually standing as single individual. Uh, when we examine our life, maybe one may be more dominant than the other in a certain situation of life, you know. So, but all of them are in a way connected, you know, as you said, that's good. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, I was wondering if you would consider, if it's considered um, in the same area of sin, if your anger is actually directed towards yourself, if you're angry with yourself or frustrated with your own behavior or lack thereof or failings, um, I have a feeling that's probably all included. No, really yeah, it's a angry to oneself because remember, you are a child of God. And as a child of God, you are graced into existence. And you have accepted that uh, you are graced into existence. And you are in communion with that graceful existence. It is a relationship always living in that graceful existence. So when you are angry to yourself, because there are so many people, in one of the reasons why people tend to commit uh, suicide, you know, because they are not uh, happy to themselves, you know, this is a very important. So uh, self-anger, I mean anger in the sense of with regard to that way, which can be a root to problem and root to cause can be a problem, okay? So sure, definitely it can also be in that sense uh, a part of the whole. But usually anger, when uh, expressed in terms of the other, becomes the prominent uh, in the tradition of the Catholic Church in, uh, in terms of making sins, etc. But this is also very important, yeah. Yes? But anger at yourself also is that you can't um, forgive yourself. And I think a lot of people um, 
they don't realize that that is a sin. If you mm-hmm. don't for, forgive yourself, you know, that is a sin because you're basically saying that God cannot forgive me. You know what I mean? And it's, that's so, you know, it's... Yes. And I just wanted to comment along the line. Um, Father Thomas, I love that part where you said, go forth, forgive, mm-hmm. before the yeah. person who hurt you in whatever way even wants your forgiveness or thinks they want it. And I just, I've had experience where it's, it's so liberating and it actually is like a boulder truly off your shoulders when you say to that person, whether it's you know, verbally or in a written form, in an email, it's wonderful, and it's also really valuable for your children to see that, too. Yeah. Thank you. Um, maybe with regard to this forgiveness, I have a beautiful example which happened in my neighborhood. Actually, I don't know, in one of my homilies I was sharing about that one. Uh, she was a nun who was stabbed to death 56 times. Uh, in a, uh, in the northern part of India where she was a missionary. Um, <clears throat> so what happened? Um, he, she was actually working for the poor people, uh, bringing some money and, you know, uh, fighting against these feudal, uh, feudal lords who were subjugating them without them growing, not giving education. So she was fighting against them in a way, okay? So they got together and wanted to kill her, and so they succeeded, and they got one person to kill her. So she was traveling on a public bus, and she was uh, stopped from behind, and then she tried to get down from the bus, and even the best people cooperated, and she was stuck, you know. So the most beautiful expression of the forgiveness, I'm just telling, her father and mother was alive, and the father and the mother went to see the person who was jailed and said, I forgive eh, you for even if, you know, and then worked for him to be released from the, uh, from the jail and he was brought, because he was very far on the north, but he was brought to my uh, home place where, he, where the family is and accepted as a brother. And she, he converted, because he was a Hindu, fanatic Hindu, he turned to be a Catholic, and today he's a Catholic. Mm-hmm. So that is the greatest expression in a way of forgive. You know, they, nobody went and told the, the father and the mother to do that one. But they themselves took, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, that's the experience, you know, forgiveness, you know, in the daily life. That means think, give before even that person comes and asks forgiveness, you see. That's the real expression. That's, you know, this is very important. And this we can do it to ourselves. This we can do to ourselves, you know. Anything that has happened in the past, nothing. In front of God, what's important is the grace of the present moment. Because every present moment is a graced moment of communion. That is where the Lord enters into communion with us. That's the most joyful expression for a Christian. That is the life of Christ within us, which we call the sanctified grace. That is why there is a stop to the sanctified grace when we actually are into this sin. That's why we need to get by through the sacrament of reconciliation. That's why we go for the sacrament. Um, I think it is 10.45, so maybe a last question, I know you must be tired. Uh, any other question? Yes, one more, and we shall conclude if you agree, okay? Yeah, or oh, two more, okay, two more, last uh-huh. question, one here, okay. Me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, like, I like everything you said. <laughs> what if, like, we apply it to our lives, there's, what, 20, 30 people here. What about those that we love? That, that are caught up in, in this, you know, in different ones. How do, how do we have the grace to address it? Yeah. And uh, this is probably a little too deep for the last <laughs> question, but um, that's why I'm here. Yeah, uh, do not lead into sadness, but rather I would say, how trust and continue to pray. Mm-hmm. And offer them at every Eucharist for these people. They are part of our own. That's why I always 
you know, in my own prayer, I always pray for my own priest or my own seminarians. And only my prayer is this, that they remain sacramentally able to give grace. And there may be people to their individual behavior pattern may not allow the flow of the grace of God to go through them. So therefore they are part of my, my body in the sense, you know. So there are people who are, you know. I am not perfect. I am sure who I am and what I am doing is the prayer of most of you and I want more than anybody else is my father and mother in heaven. My mother every day without fail prayed for me a rosary. And that is my strength, that I can, I can go anywhere in the world, I know my mother is there to pray for me. That was my greatest strength. I could stand anywhere, talk, share, uh, talk, because I came from that real conviction, that prayer. You know, sometime, remember Monica prayed for St. Agnes in how many years? <laughs> you know, change happened. But you may, yeah, you may think that change may not happen. But I had another beautiful experience recently here, actually. Um, uh, a person actually, the husband was praying for the wife, and the wife was at the deathbed. He said, I have nothing to do with the Catholic Church, I, because she had some bad experience, and uh, uh, they called for a priest to have confession and anointing. Mm -hmm. I went, heard the confession, I anointed, she died actually the following day. Mm -hmm. You see, what a beautiful experience, because since it is a confession I cannot share with you, it is one of the most beautiful experiences of the confession that I ever had. But later I spoke to the husband, he said, I was every day praying for her in my prayer. You see? So therefore, I am convinced through my life, from my experience as a priest and growing up as a Catholic and as Christian, prayer is the only way. Add your life example in a consistent way is very important. As I always say, family is the place where all this can be. Then of course, in the environment where they come into. So that's my answer. Yeah. You want to compliment? Yeah, I just want to say, I have messages sent from my family that are in the church. They don't know. Please, <laughs> yeah. I lay hands yeah. on them. Yeah. And they don't know that's why I'm laying yes, hands on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Having a mass said for a living person is way more valuable than after they die because that per person can still get grace to change. Mm -hmm. So that is, I, I do the same thing. Mm -hmm. I them, 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 them. And the other thing I think sometimes we forget is that scripture teaches that some strongholds only through prayer and fasting. Yeah. That's, yeah. So the last question, and then we will light up, okay? I just wanted to say thank you. <laughs> You're a very powerful teacher, and I just wanted to say thank you. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much. Sir. present here and uh, as I said I learn more from you than uh, me giving you something okay so see you probably next week again yes okay so for public service announcements don't leave yet so father's going to be back here next Monday and we're, we're calling this ask father so you get to ask your questions and kind of we're uh, we want to focus a little bit on you know, the problems that we're dealing with is in our current secular society. There's a lot, of, most of the hot button issues are related to that. So, uh, they'll be back. So, you're all welcome to come back. Uh, a couple other things that are coming up, I just want to say these quickly. They're mostly in the bulletin, not always. Uh, on, uh, we've, we've just started or restarted uh, weekly scripture studies on the upcoming Sunday mass readings. So there's two opportunities on Wednesdays after the four o'clock, four p.m. mass on it. Are they good counsel? They'll have a group discussing the readings for the upcoming Sunday, and then on Friday we'll have some. We'll have a group discussing those after the 8:30 mass here in the library on Friday. Two different opportunities, two different groups, two different leaders. So you're welcome to come to either one of those. And there's no commitment. You can come when, you, when you're able to come. Um, and looking ahead even further, in two weeks, Deacon Steve, who could have to leave, he'll be back here, here talking about 
uh, the Carmelite mo martyrs of, and I can't say it's the French word, but there's a uh, Carmelite mo uh, martyrs during the uh, French Revolution. It's a very compelling story. So he'll be back here talking about the martyrs. Um, let's see. And then I just, <laughs> uh, this is in the bulletins. Uh, and on July 14th, we're having our second program. We did a, a mini drama on uh, faith resolving doubt. So we did have one program, program one already. Program two is coming up on July 14th. And that'll be the evening in the church. So the first one, I don't, know if you, I don't know that all of you were there. Well received. We probably had 100 people. It's a good thing we moved it out of here into the church. <laughs> and uh, so we're going to do that. Uh, again, we'll have a second program, not a repeat, it's a, it's a continuation of the program. We're going to be looking at doubt from the perspective of reason and science, right? why people doubt. Uh, anything else? Yeah, if you want to participate, come this Wednesday night. <laughs> Sam is the director right back there. If you're interested in being part of it, he's here. You can talk to him. Um, and the last thing is, I send out like an email blast. Uh, on these upcoming events, reminders. And I send it to people that have come to something within the last year. I figure you know, those people are interested. So if you don't get those and you would like to get those reminders on upcoming events, please give Ginny your email uh, and then I'll include you on my list for emails. And that's, uh, okay, that's it. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Maybe we shall end with a blessing, final blessing, okay? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks. Thank you to you.